My name is Tzvi. I, uh, I'm coming from a company called Aqua, and I'm a security professional, as you can see from my alphabet soup after my name. And uh, if you have people in your organizations with that alphabet soup, then uh, that means they're security professionals too. So the question is, what do we want, uh, except from life, happiness, and the rest of the world? Um, security people want to make sure that applications, organizations, um, businesses run securely. So I'm going to start with a very, very basic uh, premise of where security actually fits in in the world. Um, I am new to the DevOps world. I've been a security professional for about uh, 20 years or so. I've been in the DevOps world maybe for a couple of years. And um, somebody had to explain it to me, so I'm going to explain it to you the way that it was explained to me. So let's start. If you take a piece of code that does something useful and you put it on a server where it can run, and you take that server and put it in a data center that's accessible from the outside world, um, you're going to get an application that people can use. So far, so good? All right. So where does that fit into the security world, and why do we, we, we care about this very simple or simplified construct of how applications are running? Well, because we need to not just run that application in isolation, it needs to, be, to, to do something, and unfortunately, there are uh, dangers in the world that it needs to, to deal with. So if we overlay security over that, we actually get a business. Because you can, you can take an application and you can have a great idea. Until you've done the security work, until you can run it in a way that is um, going to be um, wholesome and predictable and safe for people to use, it's really not an application. It's not really not a business. So, so where does business fit in? When we write the code, um, the code needs to be secure, meaning that the uh, program that you write is going to be predictable in its, its behavior. It needs to run on servers that can only um, run the software that you want them to run, that they're not going to be used for any other purposes. Uh, it means that your operations need to be secure, meaning if you, people start to rely on your applications, it has to be available, it has to be up and running, it has to be done in a way that gives people the confidence to run it. And are your users are your users that you intend the application to be used with, but they also could be the users that we don't want to use our applications. They are the bad people of the world. And uh, unfortunately, they're there. And uh, as we've seen too many times, there is a, a tendency to um, maybe assume that everybody is going to use the application the way that you want it to be used, but a lot of times uh, we need to take care of, of cybersecurity. So what do security people want? Security people want low-risk code, meaning that it you know, doesn't do um, more or less than it should do, running on hardened servers in a controlled environment with constant vigilance and proving compliance. So let's break that down a little bit. Um, Low-risk code uh, is the guarantee, or close to a guarantee, that the way that you write your applications is using good coding practices, it's using the, um, the latest technologies, but in a way that's safe to do, and it is not going to allow for weaknesses in the code to be exploited uh, so that the application might be used to do other things. Um, running on hardened servers means that the servers that we are running on are dedicated for the set of applications that we want them to run on, and that they are not susceptible to excess administrative action, that they are not susceptible to misuse, and that there is, there is relatively, or as much as we can guarantee, no backdoors and no misconfigurations that will allow those servers to execute. Um, a controlled environment is the same thing, just scaled up. So our entire data center, from physical security, if you're running your own data center, to security in the cloud, to multi-tenancy, to backup, to recovery, uh, all the services that uh, are used to guarantee the sustainability of, of the application. Um, and constant vigilance, which is uh, a term that encompasses a lot of things, means that security needs to guarantee that we know what's running, we know who's running it, we know under what circumstances it's running. We can see what happened. There is auditing in place. Um, there is a lot of elements that deals with just monitoring how things run, not for you know, CPU usage or memory usage or uh, the, um, the scalability, 
but for security, the ability to, to really understand and then do root cause analysis, right? All the intrusions that we've seen over the last few years uh, all had to be analyzed and overanalyzed, and we need to make sure that we know exactly what happened. And then proving compliance is kind of the odd job of security professionals. Nobody likes to issue reports about the inventory of, situ of the, um, the applications, um, what the maintenance window is, uh, whether or not we've changed passwords or we don't have a password that is admin, like somebody did not too long ago. Uh, and uh, really getting to a point where you can certify that whatever that you're running is running based on compliance, right? So, so again, so far so good. It's really simple. I know that you feel like super dumb right now. But that is the basics of, of security. And, and you really got to understand where security people are coming from because all the things that they request from developers, from operations, really come to address these. Now, there are other things that uh, are not here because they, they deal with user security, endpoint security, uh, you know, don't click links and emails, and all the other good stuff that happens. But from a data center operations, this is, this is what, what we're dealing with. So how does that fit into um, the DevOps process, right? Because so far, the previous slides had a little bit of a waterfall situation as far as the rollout of the application. We start with the code, we also do a server, and, and eventually they meet. What happens when infrastructure is code? What happens when code is infrastructure? What happens when we start to automate things in a very fast-moving way where we fail often, where we do agile development, when we have uh, multiple releases of the applications, when we run in the DevOps, and not even containers, even, even DevOps pre-containers, there is still a lot of elements that are kind of killing the security model. And in return, security is probably going to kill the DevOps model. Because if you try to introduce the existing security controls or the security controls that security people expect into a DevOps process, things start to break down. Uh, if we need to analyze uh, our code and it needs to be done in a tool that's not integrated into the environment, that means that there is a break in the chain. If we need to have uh, configuration management done before the infrastructure as a code runs, before we have our automation build our server, and then we want to start to deploy on it immediately because that's part of the same function. If we have to stop and ask for configuration management, that's a break in the process. Um, and the same thing with network, with host access controls. Uh, how do we separate automations from humans? Uh, how do we make sure that uh, our intrusion prevention and protection is still laid intact when everything is, is moving so fast? So I put DevSecOps as a question mark because I, I have the feeling that everybody pays lip service to the idea of De DevSecOps. It would be really nice if everybody collaborated and talked together. Uh, but it is really, really difficult. Um, and I have experience with organizations that we work with, and I think everybody has their own story, either from the security side talking to DevOps or from DevOps talking to security, and really not being on the same wavelength. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much the problem with DevSecOps today, in that it's hard. Those are different domain expertise. Um, automation, um, the enterprise management, data center management are things that uh, deal with uh, aspects of IT that are very different than what security deals with. There are different uh, motivations. Uh, you get measured in different ways in your organization, uh, different cost structures, uh, and, and all of the things that are just different domain expertise altogether. Another thing is that security is not really automation friendly. Um, security controls are, by their nature, a little bit messy. There's a lot of opinions in there. Uh, vulnerability management, for instance, is not a clear-cut operation. There's no good or bad. There is good until we get some mitigation on it, or bad until we have uh, uh, a, a way to uh, deal with some of the uh, uh, risks that we have in, uh, in, in vulnerabilities. Um, even configuration management, um, we always deal with exceptions. Uh, there are always rules, but they're always broken. So there's not a lot of um, clear-cut answers that can be answered by a program. And security is not really automation friendly. Uh, and the flip side of that is the DevOps is built for speed. We need to deploy quickly. We need to, to get our, our applications out there. And it is not easy to do that when we have security as gates preventing us from doing what we need to do. And then we add on top of that 
uh, dynamic cloud environments that deal with constant change, um, and the predictability is not there, and there's nothing that security people hate more than not being able to predict and not being able to do something and then make sure that it doesn't change anymore. So DevOps is hard. There is, though, something that is going to be very counterintuitive, and that is that as we move to more containerized environment, as we move towards the delivery of microservices, it seems to be a continuation of this mess. Uh, because now we've taken at least three aspects of the DevOps process and kind of merged them into one, right? So we not only uh, have infrastructure as code and code as infrastructure, they're actually all pulled together in one image, right? Your image now has infrastructure, it has um, an operating system, it has prerequisite software, it has your own application. Um, the way that it's rolled out is rolled out uh, with, with automation. So now we've rolled out and compressed the ability to deliver our applications in an automated way. The consumption of application is still there. You know, the hackers are still there. It's still being attacked more or less the same way. But the way it's delivered is really, really different. So it's, it's a problem. Um, and and the, the knee-jerk reaction of security organizations when, when we start to convert some of our applications to microservices, roll them in DCOS with orchestration underneath, is to basically say no, right? We just don't want to deal with this. Too, too much too much change, too much of a sensory overload. How do we actually get, get from under that? And there's got to be some way in which you guys, who are DevOps people, I assume, um, will need to engage with security people and come to terms with the fact that this is a, a really big disruption to, uh, to running IT. So where does that leave us? It leaves us, first of all, with security on the outside looking in. So all those services that were you know, a little bit disruptive or annoying with pre-container DevOps are almost done right impossible with post-container DevOps. Uh, it's, it's very hard to do static code analysis or stop for understanding what the networking uh, um, requirements of an application is or how to um, monitor the environment for intrusion and how to do configuration management where everything is bundled together, everything is shipped together, everything is running on the same host, everything is broken apart to microservices, and there's a lot of API work around that. So the old model is just not going to work. And, and just psychologically, you really need to understand that. The, when, when you start to do a containerization effort, when you start to do a, uh, a migration of the application, it's really going to cause real stress to security people. So let's flip a page a little bit and see what is really our way to maybe make things a little bit better. So here's a promise. What, what, what if we can actually merge that? What if we can actually make security part of the process and not having it from the outside looking in? And I want to propose two scenarios to you. One is a very security-operated, um, security-program-oriented approach, and the other one is more of a, of a pipeline approach. And we'll, we'll explore this together a little bit and see, 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 see where we get to. So, the way that, uh, remember, what security people want. They want safe code on hardened servers in a controlled environment with vigilance and compliance. So let's put a security program in place that is using the inherent properties of containerized applications to deal with some of those, those aspects. So the first thing is, is running secure code. How do we run secure code? Well, we do code analysis, and there are services out there. There are a lot of times are being used today in the pre-container world or in the DevOps pre-container world to do code analysis, your Veracodes of the world and so on. Um, those are services that are pretty well integrated into the DevOps process. There is usually in your, um, in your tools that do uh, uh, compilation, in the tools that do the packaging, there's usually a step out there that does the code analysis, and that's pretty well integrated. And that actually should be our model, right? Because that part, because it's been with us for a long time, is um, actually a model that we can employ to uh, use with other parts of the containerized environment. And I'm talking specifically about the base uh, operating system and the base images that we're going to use to build our containers on. And if you think about why, why are we having this, this step and why not just you know, do um, Ubuntu off the internet or send us off the Docker hub and build our images that way is because even 
even in the server world, every time that you install an operating system, you install your own organization's version of the operating system. There are controls in place that need to be there. There are regulations that need some hardening. There are vulnerability assessment things. All these need to be part of the deployment of an image. So one of the things that we see, and we talk to a lot of organizations, is that the practice of having a um, pipeline for base images is starting to emerge as a way to kind of jumpstart the collaboration between uh, dev, ops, and security, because that's an area that everybody can agree on, and there's some know-how in the organization. So how do we actually do that? We take the people that used to build servers, you know, the ones from the kind of middle of the, the uh, waterfall process, and take that organizational know-how, the processes of what vulnerabilities uh, should not be there. What is a good configuration? What is your password policy? What is your uh, naming convention? What is your uh, key strength? All of those can be co-opted and can be put together to create your own base images. And we start a cycle there, and you're going to see that there's, there's, there's these arrows that kind of do a cycle here, because the same way that you would you know, fail a code analysis and then have to fix your code and you run it through it again until you get it right, is the same way that we're going to do our base images. We're going to take something maybe off the internet, we're going to take a CentOS image or Ubuntu image or an Alpine image, and we're going to uh, test it for compliance with the organizational needs, and we're going to build on it, and we're going to have some iterations assessing the risk again and again until we get to a configuration that is going to be, at least from a security point of view, pretty much the same as your servers used to be, because we know that those servers are in line with your, with, 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 with your policies. Uh, and that's a great way to do a little bit of collaboration with uh, security on, on, on stuff that is pr probably don't matter to you as much, right? Because it's, it's not your code. Um, once we have the, this system in place, what we want to do is we want to build an image that is actually going to be that image that's going to run as our container. And we do the same iteration again. We're going to do the image risk and the image build until at the other side of the pipeline, we get an image that is absolutely tailored to both your application, but also for the organization's security needs. And that means uh, reducing bloat. That means that the image really should have the minimal moving parts that it needs to do its job. That means that the image is going to be well configured. That means that we have um, the right um, security posture to it. And remember, this has to go up with reports, right? The same way that security people needs to provide uh, for compliance reason, what is the state of the server environment? we anticipate that eventually they're going to need to provide what is the state of the image environment. So might as well do that and gather that, that information. Because of the nature of containers, from there on, it's really just preventing um, deviation from that image. So as containers are being rolled out, we want to make sure that there is integrity so that uh, what you put in the registry and pull to the registry is the exact same image. So you know, sign your images, calculate hashes of your images, you know, make sure that you follow the image ID. Basically, make sure along the way that you have some integrity of the image. And then once you're deploying it, really, this should not have any more disruptions in it. There should not be any human interaction. There shouldn't be any more patching. There shouldn't be any more um, touching of the image. There really nobody should exec into any container. Nobody should even SSH into any node that is running in the, in, in, in the, the, the data center. And that's actually, that represents one of the biggest changes for security, because their role basically stops you know, about three quarters away from the um, left-hand side of, of the slide. Once something goes into production, there's really little way in which we can affect change on it. And by change, we mean even fix things that, uh, that, that may be broken. And we've got to get in the habit of fixing security problems uh, in the pipeline, and if we need to fix a security problem that's been discovered afterwards, to actually go and do that uh, from, from the pipeline. So let's take a look at patching as an example of that. When we talk about patching, again, we audit the server. We, have, uh, we found that there is a configuration problem on a server, and we're talking pre-container. What do we do? We go in to patch the server. We update a package, or we change a file, or we, we update that server in production. Means maintenance windows, means uh, disruption, means downtime, means we need to audit. We need to see what administrators did on it. So there's actually a lot of trouble that goes on with patching. Contrast that with the ability to identify that there may be a vulnerability or something wrong with an image down the line in production, 
let's leave it where it is, go back, let's say, to our base image, update the packages on the base image. So the next, next Shellshock of the world comes on. We need to update our, our bash in all our images. Instead of going to 1,000 servers and update that manually or have something like Chef or Puppet or Ansible actually try and do that, uh, let's patch our base image, run our CI, because that's going to be very predictable, and then slowly, you know, DCOS, Marathon, Kubernetes is going to deploy that new patch over in the environment. That's something that is very hard to secu for security people to understand, uh, but once they understand it, it, it really points out that all the benefits that we know about running microservices uh, can actually be extended to security. Uh, and all the things that we know and like uh, about DCOS, about Marathon, uh, about, about Kubernetes, the ability to automate things on a large scale, security can co-opt that and actually make it part of, of, that, um, of the flow to fix a uh, security problem. So this is, this is the, the DevSecOps security programs if we are being container-oriented. The things to remember is we need to make sure that we have a, a good base image program, and we need to make sure that we understand where security stops, and that is as the, the image is, is deployed, we really don't have a way to affect it, so anything that we need to fix has to go back to the, the beginning. So that's, that's one picture. Another way to look at things is from a pipeline point of view, and I think that's probably going to be a little bit more uh, relevant to, to how you actually operationalize this, this whole thing. So this is our pipeline, uh, and our pipeline has distinct phases, uh, you know, build, ship, run, whatever, um, the, the flavor between th two, two and three of those. But basically, securing the, the build phase, when, when, when we have an image, what do we need to do? So, as we said, use an organization-endorsed base image that has already been corrected and published. And it's not just base image. It could be a library of base, base images. You could have your basic CentOS, basic CentOS plus Java, lean and mean, go, go and do it, basic image plus node, um, JDK, JRE. All these web technology can be packaged together and be made available and create consistency across your development streams. Uh, and not, it's not only going to be good operationally, it's actually going to be good for, for security. Um, we need to evaluate the risk based on both configuration and content. So what you put in the image besides the executables. Did you leave an SSH key in it? Do you have um, the right controls? Uh, is your HTTP server managed with SSL certificates? Where do the SSL certificates come from? How do we actually mount them? And that we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about secrets. But basically, what's in the image is important because those are going to be distributed um, along uh, the, the pipeline and, and may result in a, in a large footprint along all the servers. Scan for vulnerabilities. That's usually what people are concentrated in, but scan them against the policy. Don't just you know, send me an email with all the vulnerabilities that I have in my image because if everybody has uh, um, the, uh, the service on the Docker Hub where you get your vulnerabilities, does it make any sense to you? Do you know what, a, what CVE this or that actually means? Be no, because there is really no uh, s straight way to know that because we need to compare it against the, organ the, 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 pol the organization's policy for vulnerability. And my, something that might be relevant to one group of, of services may not be relevant to another group of services. So scan for vulnerabilities, but evaluate it uh, against the policy. And then make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, there are the, the information, let's say, about an image is what that image is, what it contains, what is it going to run, what's the entry point, um, what's the vulnerability posture, what the risk posture of the image. That, those bits and pieces are going to be at different places, uh, and we've got to make sure that everybody's on the same page. It, both development and security and operations know that this image is good enough to run because it has the right entry point. We've assessed it. We know what the risk posture is. The risk posture is relevant to what that image is going to do. If, if that image is in scope for, pick your favorite regulation, PCI, HIPAA, whatever that is, um, we need to make sure that, that that is the right way. And everybody should agree that this image is good enough to run. And that usually happens from, again, the CI side, probably at the end of the build going into test, right? We don't want to waste test time on images that are eventually going to be out, out, out of compliance for, for the organization. The next step is to start to accept only those known trusted images that we've been, uh, that have been through the, um, the evaluation process into your test and then beyond in the pipeline. 
So only accept known images. Approve images based on the risk, again, relevant to the environment that it's going to run in. Uh, maintain the integrity of the image, so sign it, take hashes of it, do whatever you need to do in order to make sure that that is the same image. Uh, and then start to keep inventory, right? One of the things that uh, security needs to provide is uh, measurement of control, measurement of compliance, inventorying, and understanding what has been pulled where, what is running where, is an important part of the process. The next thing is to operationally, as we start to then deploy things into our data center, into our clusters, is to differentiate between what's going to be out of automation, which is more predictable, less error prone than what humans can do, even though there could be errors in automation, and we've all seen those. Uh, but they are a lot more predictable. So if things go bad, they go really, really bad. And if things go well, usually they go well. But we need to separate what is automation and what is human. And that's really, really important because one of the things, one of the, the, the artifacts of this whole program is that your auditing becomes binary. Everything that you uh, get out of your container system is either something that is part of the application, part of the intended use or deployment of the application, or something that is not. And I think it's kind of a, a, a good time to tell you a little bit of story and, and, and Imagine yourself as, as working in a, in a security operations center, and you get all these screens, and everything is, is flushing you know, logs of everything, and suddenly you, you have a cluster, and there's a lot of, of, um, of networking events, and suddenly you see on one of your production servers that runs an application a you know, call out to, I don't know, uh, uh, Google for a search, or uh, trying to get into a Microsoft website or to a, a, a Linux website, uh, uh, or basically anything out of that server. So that, that's usually out of the ordinary, right? A production server should not kind of you know, send uh, an HTTP request outwards or at least attempt to do that. The question on the security operations center is, what, what is the significance of that? Is it good? Is it bad? Should I be worried, right? Every security professional in their head is going to do an immediate triage on that. And the question is, well, I don't want to raise alarms because it's, it's a pretty harmless operation, especially if it goes into a familiar site and not somewhere in Russia. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, is it in the maintenance window? Is it something that uh, an administrator might do? Maybe somebody's debugging a problem and they had to go on the server and while they're on the server, they you know, used a curl command to search something or to up upload a file. So there, there could be a lot of um, situations where it's a gray area. We really don't know if it's a problem yet. That's the problem of separating human action and dealing with people that have to go in a server environment and actually do things. And even though we think that we run a very automated environment in the cloud and everything is scripted and everything is code, there is always going to be that instance where somebody needs to fix a problem and they're going to go on a host and actually fix it. Uh, that really should not happen in containers, right? Because even the most fundamental uh, uh, problems with containers is take that node offline, your automation is going to spring up another node, so we're not going to lose service. And let's debug this offline. So, so separating those, those automation from human actions is something that is very fundamental to the way that we run with microservices and with containers. And with that, now that we control human action, we can control privilege elevation. Um, we can make sure that whatever is running inside of the containers, nobody patches them, nobody adds software to them. And we also need a, a continuous audit trail of the containerized environment um, so that we have a good understanding of what is a human operation versus uh, an, an, an automated operation. And that is going to be really what's going to eventually create a lot of trust between development and ops and security is the fact that if we put out all the rules up front, we're going to get a situation where all our data is such that it's very easy to decide if something is bad or not. And we don't have to do that triage and do all this data management in, the, in the, the security operations center. And that extends into what containers are running. So, so keep track of uh, the user context in, 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 in containers, understand what is the appropriate level of access that you should get inside of the application. If you can use a service account to run the application, please use a service account to run the application. Do not think that you can run everything on the root. Limit your executables uh, of what you have in the image to only the approved functions, something that is really needed. So don't, don't put a whole bunch of just a, a, a bin directory from your vanilla flavor Unix in something that maybe needs RM, LS, and you know, uh, ping. 
and uh, make sure that you have some context-aware network controls, right? So there's been a few talks this, uh, this week, and, uh, and the, the, the networking, the ability to put overlay networks, the, the ability to associate containers even on the same host with the right uh, networking controls is important. And then secrets management, um, because we can't put anything sensitive in the image, we have to distribute that in real time into the containers. And luckily for us, all the major orchestration tools uh, have the ability to then have secrets management. And that's something that uh, can be augmented with third party solutions. And you can even integrate it with your organizational secrets management in case you need to access services that are outside where uh, your environment is. So if we do all that, we start to give security what they actually want, right? Because we can give them low risk code on hardened images, not hardened servers anymore, hardened images. By the way, the servers themselves, they're going to be hardened by your uh, clusters. They're going to be hardened by the uh, manufacturers of the operating systems. Uh, Mesosphere is going to uh, take care of the hardening of the orchestration tool, the fact that nodes can communicate securely. Um, Docker does a lot of good things with making sure that Docker nodes can communicate securely, uh, and Kubernetes at the, the far end has trust between nodes. So th there's a level of hardening on the platform itself that needs to extend into the image so that we have good overlay on the image. Uh, controlled environment, there's not, you're not going to have a more controlled, predictable, and secure environment if you do containers the right way. Uh, and that is something that we start to educate security people on because we need to give them the tools to then go to their management and prove that there is security and there is compliance in the system. And then the constant vigilance becomes a lot easier because now we don't have that gray area. Again, if we do this right, every time something needs to be stopped, that means that it's not part of the application. There's not going to be triage anymore. We don't need mountains of data in a security operations center when we talk about containerized environment. We can pretty much predict what's going to be uh, part of the application and what's not. So I'm going to leave some time for questions, but one summary slide, which is about communication. So please talk to your security colleagues. Um, understand what your security needs are, right? The security needs of a bank are different than the security needs of a hospital and are different than the security needs of a manufacturer. There are some basic things that everybody should uphold, but the level of uh, security might be, be different. Uh, ask about compliance. Really, try, try to ask what security people need to convey further, either to compliance or to their own management. Uh, and please offer your expertise around automation. Tell them what automations can do for them. Tell them that there is a great deal of benefit that can come from giving them the patch man management example or give them the ability to view the containerized environment. You know, in a containerized environment, again, if it's well built, it's pretty self-documented. We don't need CMDBs anymore with a lot of data on them. And if they still resist, tell them that I said that containers are good for security because they truly are. And I was convinced basically the five minutes after I did my first Docker run command, it, it, it shocked me. And then later I said, well, that actually is really cool. Uh, but we're going to need to do a lot of education. So please be patient with your security people. Please understand what the motivations are. Please offer your support. And whatever you do, don't steam. Don't, 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 don't steamroll over them because at one point, even if you do get the permission to run your application or start your, your containerization project, at one point you're going to hit compliance and you can steamroll security, you really can steamroll compliance. So that, that's my soapbox. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so no, they're counterintuitive if you try to think like this. That's, that's where the problem is. And I think security is still stuck in this model. 
where everything happens sequentially, where there are distinct gates between things, when there is time to do things, when there is, uh, where security basically had more clout, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, that's where I think the mindset of more security and compliance people is. I think what we need to do is we need to tell them that they can execute even a better version of this model in the DevOps world with containers. Because the middle part of trying to do security where, where all these things are, are, are automated and fast, but also in a server environment that is, that is um, um, very prone to change and where you still have administrative action. Where, where, so so that, that, that middle world of DevOps before containers is, is where we have a problem. And, and my view is that we can execute a model that is uh, going to kind of leapfrog that with containers and, 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 and break that, that, that problem. So think, think, th th think about the, the, the tolerance for change, right? So, so. Well, the, 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 the problem is that there's still a lot of moving parts there. And, and, and I think it's the, the, the distinction is that you're still running a configuration tool to configure um, servers that are still multipurpose, where there are still a lot of processes that run on them that may or may not be needed for the application that is put on them. And there's a lot more noise, there's a lot more complexity in there that makes it hard for security to discern between lawful and unlawful operations. Oh, we're getting there. <laughs> no, but, but uh, look, if... So think, think, think about it this way. In, 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 maybe in your organization you run a super controlled, super tight, super predictable DevOps, which is awesome. But in most organizations what's going to happen is that the way to put that discipline into the real world is where containers come in. Because you cannot run in any other way a server that is single purpose and dedicated. Uh, because once you've got the image running and it has an entry point, then as you deploy it, it's going to remain the same. Only in super tight, super controlled organizations do the uh, DevOps of servers and the provisioning of machines happen in such a way that, that it does remain the same as the day it was provisioned. All right, awesome. Uh, any more questions? Uh, yes, sir. Um, well, does it give you code, host, operations, and cybersecurity? Yeah, so, so that's, that's where th there's really no right answer, right? Uh, in, in most organizations, what we found is that Docker is going to take care of Docker. So the security of the platform is awesome. On the other hand, you know, 80%, 90% of the code that's going to run in a cluster is not going to be Docker's. It's going to be your code. So how do you protect your code? Vulnerability management is one thing. Um, configuration management, which Docker doesn't touch. 
um, the uh, ability to uh, identify images, so image signing is one of them, but image signing only tell you that they're intact and who provisioned them. They, it doesn't really associate it with risk. So there are some things where Docker security is gonna fulfill a lot of those requirements. Uh, it may not be the whole picture, but that's okay. A single service usually doesn't fill the whole picture. But, it's, but it, it, don't, don't go into a, to a discussion with your security people and telling them, okay, Docker's gonna take care of all my security, because that's factually not true, and they're gonna see right through it, and then you're gonna lose credibility, right? So, so we gotta understand, tell us what your security requirements is, I'll tell you what Docker can answer, and if we need to fill those gaps with policy, with, with solutions, with open source solutions, whatever, then, then we can do that, and that makes the discussion a lot more intelligent. Yes, sir. Hmm? So I think it's a multi-pronged approach, right? We, we need to scan the, the images. Now, it, it's, it's not just that humans are fallible. It's also that over time, things get discovered that you, you might have not seen before, right? So we need to understand what our risk posture for an image is, continue to evaluate it all the time and see if something needs to change uh, in our replacing or patching. Uh, but also, the way that, um, the way that uh, containers are run, uh, if we reduce the bloat, if we reduce the attack surface, the less stuff that we put in an image, the less stuff can be exploited, the less stuff is subject to, 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 to uh, vulnerabilities. So uh, one of the things that I personally am not a big fan of is to scan actually running containers all the time because that's a very costly operation, CPU, resources, and so on. So I'm, I'm more of a proponent of let's make sure that we have good control over the integrity of the images and of the containers as they are run, and then if we know the risk posture of an image, we're then able to um, reflect on the containers that run from it and, and extrapolate that data and find that, uh, that, that uh, vulnerability in the container. So it's, it's an operational model that, that relies on the fact that, that the, the lifespan of containers is fairly short and we're able to replace them and we're able to replace them on a, on a large scale. So if we, if we do good assessments of the image, we can then roll them out. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying that the container is going to run, but, but we've seen that people release multiple times a day, and it, it's not because containers are, are, are not going to run for very long, but because just the way that software is, is updated, they're just going to be replaced over time. Yeah, I would also say that, that, that uh, so I, I, in principle, I, I agree with you that, that containers don't have to basically be replaced, but what we've seen in reality is that because of release cycles uh, and because of the fact that you run with orchestration that is free to kind of move containers around, and when they do that, they actually re-instantiate them from the image. So, so the, 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 life, the lifespan of container is relatively short, especially when, 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 when concerned with, uh, with servers. But that's really where we are, right? If, if, we, 
If we limit what's in the image to begin with and then not allow any addition uh, executables or, or administrative action on a container, uh, we can, uh, with a great degree of confidence, make sure that we do our security vulnerability assessment uh, ongoing on the images, and that will give us an accurate picture of where we are vulnerability-wise on the uh, containers. And if something needs to be fixed, we can fix the image and then roll a new version of all the containers. I see you're not convinced. <laughs> well, you, you, you. <laughs> No, no CISO is going to ever tell you that they're damn center about everything. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, okay. When, when I say should, I actually mean that 99 plus percent. Okay, that's, that's, that's where I am. But, but one thing that you'll see with security professionals is that we are, we are a non-committal bunch because we've been burned so many times. All right, people, I'm standing between you and beer, so um, thank you very much.